Welcome to the Fire These Times, I'm your host Joey Ayoub. If you'd like to support this podcast as well as other projects, please head out to patreon.com slash times or check out the support page for other methods. If you cannot donate, you can still support this podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening and stay safe out there. So this is a conversation with Zhang Jing Li and Eli Friedman about the book that I edited called China on Strike, Narratives of Workers' Resistance. Through the story of labor insurgency in China, we go into the world of narratives and ideas. We explore the contrast between a government's projected image and its reality. My guests do an excellent job at exploring what's essentially impossible to do in an hour or so. Modern China, or at least parts of it. We go into the contradictions inside of China's economic system, the impacts of both the COVID-19 global pandemic and the US-China trade war, as well as the experiences of a segment of Chinese workers, experiences which have global connotations and which we can learn from. This will be the last original episode of the Fire These Times of 2020. There will be one episode released next week, which will be the edited version of a panel that I participated in and which is about a recent book that I co-wrote, entitled A Region in Revolt, Mapping the Recent Uprisings in North Africa and West Asia. This book looks at the recent uprisings in Sudan, Algeria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Iran. And if you're new to the Fire These Times, you can check the back catalog for the previous 54 episodes. Take care everyone, and I hope you have nice holidays. Please stay safe, keep a distance, wash those hands, and wear that mask. Take care. So my name is Zhong Jing Li. I am an assistant professor in the economics department at University of Missouri. Kansas City, and I um, mainly work on topics related to labor and uh, um, economic development. I focus on the political economy side of social development and with the regional focus on East Asia. And I'm an associate professor at Cornell in the Department of International and Comparative Labor. Uh, my research has focused on Chinese labor issues, on rural to urban migration and urbanization. I've been going to China for more than 20 years, have spent a lot of time living there and doing research. It's gotten a lot more difficult uh, to travel there and to do research in the last couple of years, but it is still my area of, uh, of expertise and uh, I've written um, a couple of uh, books, including this the translation, uh, China on Strike, that Zhong Jin and I uh, got to work on together. So let's start with the book itself. It focuses on migrant workers in Guangdong province's Pearl River Delta. Can you tell us what you mean by migrant, first of all, because there's a specific definition in the book, and why that region, you know, it's, it's kind of its global significance as well. And I feel like this would at least help us anchor our conversation uh, from now on. Yeah, so by migration in this book, we largely focus on rural to urban migrants in China. The number of uh, migrant workers has been increasing um, quite steadily. Around 19, I think around early 1990s, the number was roughly 100 million. Right now, last year, I think last time I checked, the number was 290 million. That was roughly, I think, 36 or 37 percent of the total labor force in China. And these workers, most of them work in construction, manufacturing, and low-end service sector jobs. Many of the jobs are in the informal sector. They really make huge contribution to the Chinese, so-called Chinese miracle. I would just add a couple of points um, to what Zhang Jin has already said. Uh, and the first thing is to uh, contextualize who these migrant workers are in China um, and sort of who we're comparing them against. So when we think back to the state socialist period, uh, you had a system referred to as the Iron Rice Bowl, which provided workers in industry with lifetime employment and with relatively generous benefits. Of course, China was not wealthy overall, so there's sort of absolute levels uh, of material comfort were lower than in, in developed countries, but uh, they were relatively uh, privileged and, you know, they basically couldn't be fired. There was, there was, you know, hardly a labor market at all. And through the HUCO system, which is something I'd like to say a little bit more about, that's the household registration system. Uh, in the late 1950s, it divided China's population 
And so people are given either an ur urban or a rural HUCO designation. And so it sort of split the, the country into these, these two segments. And it was very difficult to move from rural to urban areas. So the peasantry was to stay in, in the countryside and, and the urban people were given uh, these, these sort of jobs in, in, the, in these work units. Um, and so the, the thing that's really significant about this huge increase in migration that Joan Jean just referred to over the last 30 or, or even 40 years is that, you know, if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, there was very little rural to urban migration. And so this huge influx of people from rural areas uh, to cities is sort of, that, that, that is the workforce specifically for the private sector. So as private capital has come into China beginning in the late 1970s and invested in the kinds of export processing, manufacturing that we're familiar with and more recently in services, um, it's really been that that rural rural to urban migrant workforce that's been the backbone of that. And in some important ways, there is still um, distinctions between rural people and urban people, even if those rural people are living and working in cities, even if they were born and grew up in cities, there are some persistent kinds of formal discrimination uh, that they have to deal with. And we can talk more about that if you're interested. I was actually going to transition to a similar question. Agency is, is definitely one of the themes of the book and especially workers agency. And this in itself is in stark contrast, at least from my own experience to what I usually read if, I ever, if, if the topic ever comes up in the English language media in the first place. So can you talk a bit more about agency and through that question, sort of flesh out the book a bit more like the strikes, which, uh, how did you select the, or how did the original editor select the strikes? What, what is the book about? Because I know there's something very specific about it. The students who willingly went back to work in factories, all of that. This is a big part of the story that is often not told, I feel. Right. So the focus of book is more on the strike cases editors selected. And I think this has the intention to contradict to the more conventional wisdom on Chinese workers in terms of um, the organization level and the activism or the militancy of the um, Chinese workers, largely because the um, conventional image of Chinese workers focus on the low cost or even being quite docile on the um, front line of the production. And this really contributed to kind of the false belief that Chinese workers are quite just following the orders and not really struggling for their own benefits. So the book really shows these detailed case studies. They are stories of strike and the concerns and the backgrounds of these strikes. We really want to show these stories to challenge the conventional ideas about the Chinese workers. And I think for my own end, I would really emphasize this kind of labor militancy story um, goes beyond the ethical consumerism that we can consider in the West in terms of how we can work together for these progressive projects. And also it helps us to understand the deep contradictions in the Chinese economic system, right? And also help us to consider what might be the alliance we can seek in order to help this whole process. And just to add to that, I think a little bit of an understanding about what this book was and what the intended audience was. So, you know, we have this English edition uh, and this is sort of targeted obviously at people who are English speakers. And so it's, it's by dint of, dint of the language, it's, it's aimed at an international audience and, mm -hmm. and trying to counter the sort of some of the things that Zhang Jin mentioned about a kind of a corporate social responsibility framework and showing, no, you know, Chinese workers are taking things into their own hands, that it's these struggles that are being organized within the workplace autonomously without any support from, from unions or from, you know, sympathetic government agencies. That is really sort of at the forefront of a struggle. I think globally, you could make the argument, uh, certainly at the time. But, but it's important to remember that the book was written in Chinese by Chinese activists. And when they wrote it, they had no idea that this was eventually going to turn into an English book. And they wrote it in Chinese because those, some of those misperceptions about Chinese workers' docility exist in China as well as outside of China. And one of the things that I found sort of perplexing when I was doing field work in China, studying the, the sort of government responses to labor strikes, is that I would go and I would talk to workers and labor activists um, in China, and they would say, oh, well, you know, China's not like the United States. In the United States, you have so much freedom, and so there's so much 
people are going on strike all the time and workers are sort of free to express themselves, which is, you know, very much not the case. And uh, I mean, there has been promising uptick in strike activity in the United States in the last couple of years. But, you know, I mean, the strike activity has just, you know, nosedived and, and obviously we have a very hostile state uh, in the United States. And so I was there and I was like, well, no, there's in China, there's thousands of strikes that are happening. Uh, every year, but the sort of the general understanding in society is precisely that of sort of Chinese worker docility and that they have no capacity to to fight back. So, so again, the, the authors, you know, wrote this book to demonstrate to, to a domestic audience, right, that this stuff is happening. Here's the process by which it happens. And, and the sort of the structure of um, a lot of the chapters is to sort of show how the strike is organized, why it happens, and then to sort of draw some practical lessons from it. And so it was very much uh, sort of conceived of as having practical consequences for worker self-organization within China itself. Right. I, I also want to add to kind of um, the minor point regarding the militancy aspect, regarding the Chinese workers being docile, that aspect, a lot of literature has been focusing on female workers, but the stories selected in this book actually shows that many of the strikes you could find very active role by female workers. And I think that gender aspect, and you can see the um, solidarity among female workers and male workers, in planning some strategic actions uh, were very noticeable in this process. So that's something I would also want to kind of emphasize. A lot of news reports regarding, even regarding the labor strikes in general, tend to really under document or underestimate the size of strikes in China. And it's really hard to document these kind of spontaneous and sporadic uh, strikes. So I, I do think, um, just to echo Eli's point, that book provide, this, this book really provides a more detailed story and uh, the story told by workers themselves, which will really help to add the literature on this topic. Maybe I could have just one one more point on, on the agency. You know, I mentioned this in passing, but I think it's important to emphasize uh, that in China, there's only one official trade union called the All China yeah. Federation of Trade Unions. And, you know, they have a, a structure down to the local level and branches within most, you know, large uh, enterprises. That union federation is, according to its constitution, subordinate to the to the Communist Party. And, and the consensus, uh, certainly scholarly consensus, and among, I would say, independent activists, is that it is not, it tends not to side with workers. It's more likely to even side with management than it is with workers and sees its role as sort of administering labor conflict rather than mobilizing. And there are basically, with I can only think of one exception in the sort of reform era in which a union has actually been involved in organizing a strike. So there are a huge number of strikes that take place uh, in China, but they're all done without any sort of union organization. And any effort to establish a formal organization that's based on union, on sort of membership dues, or that's sort of self-sustaining in any sort of way, will be seen as a real uh, security threat uh, by the state and will will be pretty quickly stamped out. So, so it, you know, it, it, it's just important to understand the agency that these are, you know, so-called spontaneous strikes. I mean, they're not spontaneous. Grievances are sort of long standing, but they're spontaneous in the sense that they are self-organized, that the sort of the, the organizational form is very ad hoc and tends to kind of dissipate actually after the strike, unfortunately. But that's another big difference uh, from most other countries or many other countries. Can you sort of make the distinction, maybe for those who don't know, between like what we might understand as a labor movement and, oh, in the case of China, more of like a labor insurgency? Can you sort of make that distinction? You know, this is something of an academic distinction, uh, but I think it's worth emphasizing. So when we think about labor movements in liberal democracies, but in other countries as well, you can think of sort of authoritarian uh, South Korea as, as being one example. You think about sort of formalized worker organizations, right? That, that can that are, that are sort of durable and that can organize workers across workplaces and across regions, that they have sort of sustained and oftentimes clearly articulated political aims so that it's not just we want, you know, a wage increase where we want this law to be implemented, but we're, we're making sort of sustained demands on employers and maybe even the state related to collective bargaining rights or the right to strike or, you know, the eight hour workday or, you know, these are just some examples from the 20th century. So when, when I and others have talked about thinking about Chinese worker resistance as an insurgency rather than a labor movement, it's to say that none of those things exist. So there's a huge amount of labor conflict in China. As Zhongjin mentioned, we don't know, we don't 
know the precise number. It's very difficult to collect data on this, uh, but we do know that it is that it is widespread. But it's extremely localized, right? So these strikes are organized basically just within a particular workplace. They don't extend. It's not sort of all of the workers in one city going on strike at the same time, or all of the workers in an in industry sort of nationwide coordinating their strike activity. There, there are a, a few sort of minor exceptions, particularly with logistics workers, where there have been these kind of trans-regional strikes. Um, but by and large, they're, they're quite confined uh, to a single workplace, sometimes very, very small workplaces. Uh, you know, I've started to do some research on platform-based food delivery workers. Uh, and I know Jung Jin has something to, to say about this as well. But, you know, sometimes you have these stations within cities, and you'll just have like, 10 workers that go on strike, you know, just in this one tiny little, you know, subcontracting station. Uh, and mm -hmm. then it gets resolved in a couple hours. And so it's very, very small scale. So that creates a different kind of a dynamic uh, when workers are not kind of politicized and mobilized in, the, in this kind of persistent way. And it, the reason is straightforward that the Chinese government is quite opposed to the formation of an independent labor movement. Uh, they talk about it in China as um, solidarity disease, and that's referencing the solidarity movement from Poland um, in the 1980s, which uh, you know led eventually to the downfall of of the Communist Party there. Uh, so th they they see that as a real threat to their power, uh, and so and it's also a very competent and capable state. Uh, so so they have a lot of capacity to ensure that that sort of stuff doesn't happen. Right. I would. I guess I would probably add even the earlier strike or labor unrest regarding workers, especially from former social uh, state-owned enterprises against privatization. Those strikes or those labor unrest were also largely localized, rather than being really cross-sector or cross-region. Yeah. Thank you for that. And this sort of also brings me to. You both mentioned both in our pre-chat and you kind of hinted at it as well earlier in, in this uh, conversation that things have gotten worse in recent years. Why is that? I guess first I probably would emphasize the material condition to this labor unrest. Part of the reason is I think after roughly 2014, I would say the labor or the capital accumulation rate has been declining. All this kind of the growth rate of capital accumulation has been declining. We are seeing the new investment in fixed assets in manufacturing sector has been declining. And I think that really shows kind of relatively slowing down of the industrial growth, as well as some of the transfer to um, service sector. The other reason I, want, I can think of is probably the kind of the more recent trade war, and as well as the economic slowing down in general actually makes probably the state as well as capital less willing to make compromise with workers. You know, I think they uh, has become more probably become more aggressive regarding labor activism and the labor militancy. Um, that's part of the reason I can think of regarding the becoming mild labor unrest, especially in the coastal areas. But I do notice there's some clear shift of capital accumulation from coastal provinces, where usually labor NGOs have quite developed compared to inland. So with the shift of capital accumulation to some extent, probably we'll see a mild labor unrest in the coastal areas, but more labor activism and militancy in other parts of China. So one thing that political scientists have uh, talked about in China for a number of years was this idea of performance-based legitimacy. Uh, so, you know, when, when they sort of turn their back on some of the things associated with the Maoist form of state socialism under Deng Xiaoping's reforms, they, they were sort of leaving behind that kind of revolutionary legacy to some extent and shifted to this form of performance-based legitimacy, which basically says, you know, you're not going to have sort of democratic freedoms. And that became, of course, very clear after 1989. But what we are going to ensure for you is a sort of a regular, regularly increasing uh, sort of material standard of living. Um, and they delivered on that, right? I mean, China, you know, inequality grew a lot, but even sort of, you know, poor people um, were not getting worse off. And, and you know, by and large, their material uh, situation was improving at least somewhat. And so, you know, I think what you begin to see and this is just building off of what Jones already said, as growth has slowed, 
uh, in China uh, over the past 10 years um, that, you know, there's an awareness uh, among, among the party leadership that they can't depend on just, you know, having 10% growth every year. And that when you have 10% growth, you can kind of absorb a lot of conflict, right? Because things in general are, are, are still sort of improving materially and they're not in that that world anymore and so so that's had a, i think a big effect on on the political situation across the board and, and and you know i should just say that in 2015 there was a crackdown on the sort of the few small labor uh, independent labor ngos uh, that exist mostly in guangdong and some other parts of the country as well that really signaled signaled uh, to labor activists that there was a political tightening but in that same year the state had also targeted lots of other groups including these so-called rights defense lawyers who were sort of you know bringing lawsuits um, against the government and there was environmental activists and feminist activists so a lot of groups that were seen as potentially wanting to stir up trouble face this sort of greater uh, restriction and labor activists um, were no exception so th there's definitely there's definitely a connection there. There's one other thing to, to mention uh, in terms of uh, the character of the strikes. And this again, has to do with some structural changes in the economy. The most, I would say, aggressive um, phase of this labor insurgency that we saw was basically from when growth resumed after the economic crisis. So as the economic crisis in 2008, very quickly growth resumes in 2009, 2010, the economy is doing well, labor markets, particularly in the Pearl River Delta are quite tight. And so from that period, 2010, really through 2014, 2015, um, you see some, to me, quite inspiring large scale strikes making aggressive demands and, and that are pretty well organized. But because of this kind of capital relocation, both from the Pearl River Delta to the interior of China and also to other places in Southeast Asia and South Asia, uh, the sort of the structural position of workers in manufacturing has been really impacted. Uh, quite significantly. Uh, and, and of course, the US-China trade war has only accelerated that. And I feel like every day I open, you know, I see that some news about uh, factories relocating to Vietnam or, or something like that. So what that means is that the, this labor insurgency was really rooted in, in the manufacturing sector, as has been the case in lots of other countries and other historical uh, time periods, and their position was being undercut. So increasingly, what we saw was that the strikes were not sort of on the, they weren't on the offensive demanding higher wages, they're on the defensive and just sort of saying, well, we want basic laws implemented or even strikes around factory closures or factory relocations. So I would just briefly plug uh, another book mm -hmm. two years ago, another English translation uh, of a book by the same a group of writers who did China on strike. And the translation, uh, the English translation is called Striking to Survive. And it's mostly focuses on, on this one case study, but it has some other uh, strikes in there as well. And it's it's called Striking to Survive because it's about the kinds of labor conflicts that happen when factories are shutting down and relocating and workers are just trying to ensure that they get their back pay. And so that's that's a very different kind of a dynamic, right? Even if there are still labor conflicts, from a political standpoint, it's less optimistic because you're just sort of fighting over whatever crumbs you can get from capital before they before they go somewhere else. Right. All, whiting, uh, all fighting for like the social benefits, right? Social security payments, these things. I think that's really kind of on the defensive side. And speaking of these um, historical transitions, I think many people listening, they think of China as, well, China is a communist state. And we're talking about the Chinese Communist Party. So we're talking about communism. But at the same time, what you're describing is obviously not that. And Eli, you yourself wrote an article some months ago. The title is very straightforward, Why China is Capitalist. What are the main arguments and why did you feel the need to write it in the first place? You know, I wrote the article because the journal asked me to. <laughs> and, you know, at first I was kind of like, do I really need to do this? Because among, you know, I think people who are sort of serious about sort of studying China. It's, there's not much of a debate. But, you know, what we've noticed over the past couple of years uh, is that in left activist circles outside of China, um, there's been uh, the development of this kind of current of whatever you want to call it, sort of, let's call it pro-communist party left, derogatorily referred to as tankies. You know, th there's a sort of a spectrum of people, some who are just sort of uncritical, anything the Chinese Communist Party does is good because it's leading to world revolution. Those are, that's the sort of the least serious wing. Two people who sort of say, well, China might not be perfect, but you know, if we look at the sort of 
imperialist struggle against the United States, anything that strengthens the Chinese state is sort of a, a sort of a net plus for the people of the world. And so therefore we need to support the Chinese state. So, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of a range of opinions, but there's a lot of, a lot of folks out there who um, have a pretty su superficial understanding of what's going on in China. They see a Chinese state that refers to itself as a uh, socialist or socialist with Chinese characteristics or market socialism or something like that. It's controlled by the Communist Party that talks about Marxism, and it seems like a sort of, a, you know, a, an appealing alternative to, um, you know, to the sort of uh, chaos of American uh, decline and this, the very nasty form of neoliberal capitalism that still exists here. So, you know, I want to be sympathetic to it and and sort of acknowledge the fact that there are not, vi there are not a lot of viable left alternatives out there. At the same time, as uh, you know, a committed uh, leftist and a socialist, someone looking at China, it is it, it is not, to my mind, a, a model worth pursuing. Or you know, sort of uncritical support of the state seems like a big mistake to me. So I thought it was important to just kind of lay these these, these basic arguments out. And the argument, as you say, is in the title that China is capitalist. And the way that I, I, I proceed to do that, I start with just some kind of Marx 101, right? So how would Marx approach this question? As in capital, he might start from the commodity. A commodity is a use value. Uh, and an exchange value. And when you have sort of generalized commodity production, that means that things, things are being produced as commodities rather than in response to sort of human need. And if you look at the way that things are produced in China, they are produced as commodities. And you can look at the sort of obvious examples like cell phones and computers and socks and t-shirts. These are all produced commodities, but you can also look at the things that you might imagine a socialist society would try to sort of attack first before they get to the kind of, before they get to the t-shirts and the, and the cell phones. Things like housing, right, or or, or things like medical equipment, uh, these things which are sort of basic to human need uh, are produced as commodities. And you know, I talk a little bit about the housing market. Many of, of Chinese uh, of China's uh, wealthiest wealthiest billionaires uh, made their money in the housing market. Um, and you know, housing is a real crisis in, in big Chinese cities, precisely because of its commodification. But then the sort of the next step in the argument, and the one that I think is kind of more um, sort of more politically potent way to approach the problem, is to ask sort of not how commodities are produced, but actually how is it that workers survive? Uh, and in, in a socialist society, uh, presumably you would see it might be imperfectly realized, but you would see a political economy that is oriented. Uh, to uh, responding to social need and that people would be able to survive based on the fact that they are people. And what we see in China, as in every other capitalist country, is that the way that the overwhelming majority of people need to survive is by making themselves somehow useful to capital. There's private labor markets, they have to go out, they have to find a job. And if you cannot make yourself useful to capital uh, in sort of advancing capital accumulation, then you are unlikely to be able to survive, certainly not likely uh, to be able uh, to flourish. And so there are big differences in terms of thinking about the political economy. If you look at China and you want to compare it, say, to sort of a neoliberal, you know, Anglo-American model, right? China is not the United States. It's not becoming more like the United States. China is not like, you know, you could, there's lots of different kinds of capitalisms out there, right? But if, you know, one of the things that people often say in defense of the idea that China is, is socialist is that the state still controls the sort of the commanding heights of the economy. And that's true. But if you look at the percentage uh, of GDP that's accounted for by the state sector, it's high and it's higher than most other capitalist states. But actually, it's not higher than, than Taiwan was in the late 1970s or 1980s. There's lots of examples of major state involvement in the economy, be it in the sort of the classic French model, you know, in the Indian sort of, you know, Nehru post, post dependence model. So I basically make the point that state involvement in the economy does not make socialism. If we look at this kind of perspective of how is it that workers survive, they survive by attaching themselves to capital by that, by that sort of definition, China is capitalist. And then the final piece, it's already go on, but the final piece is sort of a, a practical one, right? The reason that I'm, I'm engaging this question is just to ask, you know, is the Chinese state worthy of the support of left? of the left, if the answer is it's capitalist, then, then no, it's not. And so basically what that means in the context of intensifying this inter-imperial rivalry between the United States and China, that the left can't side with either one of these, right? These are, neither of these, these states are worthy of our support. And this is, you know, it's not an easy answer, right? But, but I believe in sort of um, a leftist internationalism that has to sort of chart our own ways uh, and sort of be, um, form sort of networks of solidarity and social movements uh, across borders. It's an old story. It's not an easy one to pursue, um, but I, I think that it's, it's the only, uh, I think that it's the right one.
listeners of this podcast would already know what I'm about to say because I've said this so many times. Unfortunately, I have had my own issues with tankies for a very long time now, especially when it comes to Syria, whose regime the Chinese government obviously supports. And Syria, well, Bashar Assad still officially, whenever it suits uh, the regime, mentions the same kind of narrative, anti-imperialism, uh, state socialism, etc., etc. Whereas the trade unions are completely decimated. The opposing communist party is completely decimated. There is a loyal communist party which doesn't do much communism. <laughs> I've seen that side of the, um, to put it very mildly, of the left-wing spectrum the more authoritarian side, let's say, firsthand as well. And it's been years of that. And it's through that, actually, that I ended up linking up with activists from countries that seem to also face the, um, these kinds of obstacles, let's say, especially in a, in a much more globalized uh, social media environment, if you want, in the, in the, on the digital uh, front. So I can include Ukrainians, uh, Nicaraguans, Hong Kongers, uh, people from so many other countries. And some of the episodes that I've done so far have gone into these specific cases. The first one was on Hong Kong and the second one was on Venezuela. So uh, it's definitely a recurring theme. And I wanted to semi-awkwardly transition to ask about, you know, part of the difficulties of the past few years in Hong Kong, in this specific example. And of course, most people would have heard about for the protests in Hong Kong. Most people would have heard about what's been happening in Xinjiang. And here I'll say that I have also had an episode on both of them recently. Do we have any sense of the sort of links that have been built or that could be built between, let's say, the average protester in Hong Kong and labor activists, again, let's say, in Guangdong. And here I'm kind of asking this question very broadly and very vaguely because, to my knowledge, what well, I haven't seen it, but I am curious because at the end of the day, if they are, quote-unquote, facing the same opponent, in this case being the centralized uh, Chinese government, are there these potentials that you see that could be built? Have they been built? Uh, what can you sort of tell us about that? I do see somewhat common kind of opponent for workers in Guangdong province and workers in Hong Kong in terms of the capital they would like to fight against. And that actually was the beginning story of the coastal labor unrest. Most of the capital there were initially located from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, from the nearby Southeast Asian regions. So I do think, I mean, it was kind of a labor relocation, uh, a capital relocation story represented by manufacturing sector being relocated from Hong Kong to mainland China. So in this end, I would say it is kind of, you can see uh, workers being attacked by the mobility of capital. And I would really hope this become some kind of um, united front among the uh, left forces uh, in two areas. But of course, the story is more complicated with the political force, with centralized um, political force, and also with all these kind of other concerns in the movement, local movements and also related with the relationship between mainland and Hong Kong. I spend a lot of time thinking about Hong Kong. Um, I, I spent a fair amount of time in Hong Kong uh, over the years. And one thing to note is that a lot of the labor activism that emerged in Guangdong, I don't want to say it was caused by activists from Hong Kong, but activists from Hong Kong had a major role in establishing NGOs, in um, in sort of developing kind of these frameworks, a kind of a, a consciousness around labor activism. You know, I don't want to be sort of paternalistic about it. Chinese workers are perfectly capable of of developing their own forms of resistance that, and have done so. But there was a kind of an infrastructure that that people from Hong Kong played a really important role in developing beginning in the 1990s. That has come under severe attack. And so any connections between Hong Kong and, and the mainland have been severely attacked since, uh, since 2015, and so they've become badly attenuated. You know, when I was in Hong Kong in 2019, one of the things I, I was talking to some, some of these Hong Kong-based labor activists, and one of the things that they said about their participation in the movement in Hong Kong was that the Chinese government had made it impossible for them to do anything in China, and so they just sort of refocused their attention uh, to Hong Kong and were sort of throwing themselves in, in, into the movement there. So, you know, that's the sort of the optimistic story. The, the, you know, the answer to your question about the possibilities now of 
you know, solidarity of linkages between the movement in Hong Kong or, or what's left of it. It's in the process, of course, of being decimated. Um, and workers in, in Guangdong or elsewhere in mainland China, it is extremely unlikely. And we have not seen really any positive signs over the past, you know, I mean, the movement in Hong Kong has been pretty intense since 2014. So, you know, there, there has not been a lot. And there's, there's a lot of reasons for why that's the case. I mean, one is you said that they sort of share a, a common enemy. You know, workers in China don't see it that way. So when they're organizing, they're not saying to themselves, we're organizing against the Communist Party because the Communist Party organizes this entire system that exploits us. The way it's sort of, it, some might think that, you know, privately, but the way it's sort of articulated and the way it's framed is, well, we have this boss who is exploiting us and maybe there's some local government official who is siding with the boss and we're going to sort of mobilize against them. But they're not out there sort of holding signs saying, you know, like, you know, uh, destroy the Communist Party or anything like that. And in Hong Kong, they, they very clearly are, right? They, they see Beijing as being the enemy, as being the sort of the force that is destroying, um, you know, democracy and, and Hong Kong autonomy. So, that, so that's one piece. And the, the second piece, and this is the one that is, is quite unfortunate, and I'm sure, you know, you're familiar with this issue. You have a, a segment, it's not all of the movement, but a segment of the movement that is actually quite anti-Chinese in Hong Kong, uh, and that manifests itself in some pretty nasty nativism uh, and xenophobia directed at people from mainland China. That gets played up a lot, you know, by tankies in the West. They sort of say, look, here's you know, pictures of, of people in Hong Kong carrying a Trump sign or something, and they say this is the whole movement. It's not. Leftists have been basically without exception uh, supportive of the movement for more democracy in Hong Kong. But you have this segment, and that segment is uh, the part of the movement that the Chinese government plays up the most in the media, right? And also mainland Chinese people in Hong Kong, a lot of them do have direct experiences with this kind of xenophobia and it definitely leaves a bad impression. So to the extent that people in mainland China are getting information about the movement through official channels, which is how most people get most of their information, what they see is people are rioting, people who are anti-China, people who want to uh, make Hong Kong independent from China and people who are engaged in this kind of, you know, anti uh, anti Chinese uh, sorts of activity, and so that doesn't that doesn't establish a sort of a, a good you know basis of trust for establishing the kind of solidarity that would be needed, and it'd be you know also extremely dangerous uh, you know to try to do that because it would be seen as um, yeah quite subversive on both sides in some ways that it would it benefits. Obviously, the Chinese government to portray the protests in Hong Kong that way. Its apologists in the West, the, those that were conning tankies, would do so as well. And it also benefits, you know, the more U.S. conservatives that she that sees China as the the root of all evil. And by saying, well, you know, Hong Kong is clearly want us to save them. We need to do more, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in many ways, it plays up both the governments in this specific example and those that get lost in the process are the actual protesters. And this is a very, very common, unfortunately, a very common experience in, in my region as well. Uh, as, as in, you know, Ukrainians stuck between America and Russia, you know, this does get played out quite often when, whenever you're stuck between inter-imperialist rivalries and that sort of thing. And I do appreciate the way you framed it as well, because at the end of the day, if some one is interested in what we might call left internationalism, global solidarity, um, all of that. We do need to do better than what we've been seeing uh, recently. Although I, I'm, I would say that I also tend to see them more frequently than other people might. So I may have a disproportionately negative impression of a lot of the quote-unquote global left due to that, due to the bad experiences when it comes to Syria and when it comes to Ukraine, which followed my experience with Syria. I also recognize that it is a minority but it is a very loud minority and there has to be multiple ways of challenging that. And, you know, this conversation is part of my attempts to do so as well. You, so kind of to go back a bit to the book, you, you've mentioned, and I think it was in the introduction, you call the book a, a shining example of public sociology. What, did, what exactly did you mean by that? And uh, you also, uh, if I remember correctly, you mentioned that it's a, you know, it could be used as an instruction manual. Also, what exactly did you mean by that? And how could listeners, let's say, that pick up the book, how can they see this also as an instruction manual? So I'm the sociologist, so I guess I'll <laughs> deal with the public sociology thing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about what, what public sociology is. 
um, and you, you know you don't have to be an academic sociologist to do it but the the point is is essentially the production of knowledge that has a practical relevance right so you can do a totally academic study of strikes that is purely concerned with with, with sort of the you know the theoretical implications or how it fits in with the literature or whatever that's that's one brand of sociology and it, it serves a purpose this is about knowledge production, right? So they went, they used tools. You can call it sociology, you can call it workers inquiry, whatever it is. They went, they spoke to workers about how their lives are organized, where they live, what, you know, the food they eat, the, the way they survive, right? And as well as what's going on in the workplace for them and did it in, in a pretty systematic way. I mean, this is not, uh, you know, if you were submitting this to a sociology journal and you had to talk about the sort of the sampling method, I mean, this is not like a representative sample of like, what the average worker in China experiences. No, they went and they they talked to workers who they they knew had sort of organized um, strikes, but they generated a body of information and you can identify patterns right across them about the way that the way that workers organize about the kinds of um, that you know the kinds of grievances that that sort of push people to work about the sort of the ways that employers and government officials or the courts or the police are sort of likely to respond in different sorts of circumstances, and you know this is this is knowledge that the Chinese state doesn't want workers to have. You know this book cannot be published. They couldn't go to sort of the you know the People's Press or some major university press and get it published. They had to sort of do self-publishing, right? Because this is. Um, it, it's controversial. And so generating that kind of, you know, relatively systematized sort of form of knowledge about how people organize, how people resist, and then disseminating it, that to me is, that's what public sociology really ought to be about. And so that's also the, you know, related to the question of uh, it being an instruction manual. And so like, you know, there's, there's examples about, you know, tactics that workers use to counter police violence. You know, that's just sort of one example. So like what, what might police do? Like when you leave the factory, what kind of a response might that, that generate? And that's something that other activists can use. I also think of it, and maybe this is sort of more ambitious than, than is warranted, but you know, I'm an American. I live in the United States. I talked about the sort of declining uh, strike numbers and declining capacity for workers' autonomous resistance here. Um, I really do see lessons here that are more broadly applicable beyond just China, because we live in in, a, in the sort of you know neoliberal world where unions um, in all countries have come under attack, where their capacity uh, has been diminished over the last several decades, and, and you know, no no place, at least among Western countries, more so than the United States, where unionization rates are extremely low. And so, the sort of the basic insight about well, when you have a grievance in the workplace, you know, how do you identify how do you identify the grievance? How do you identify a collective grievance? How do you go about talking to workers in what kinds of spaces and take action on your own, whether you have a union or not, whether you have laws that are going to support you going on strike or not? walking off the job sort of at the point of production, that, that is a form of leverage that workers everywhere have. And American workers had sort of forgotten that. And just for the last couple of years, there's been this huge upsurge of wildcat strikes, right? I think marked uh, first, you know, in 2018 with, this, with the teacher strikes. Um, but particularly, you know, since COVID started, there've been a huge number of, of basically Chinese style strikes. And so one of the things that I've done, and this is sort of going a little bit beyond your question, but I've started a sort of a data collection project here in the United States that's based on China, China Labor Bulletin maintains the strike map where they collect these kind of incidents of wildcat strikes uh, because the official data don't reflect it. We found in the United States, well, also the official data don't reflect what workers are actually doing on the ground because they're only looking for sort of collective bargaining agreements and legal, you know, informing your workers ahead of time. That's not how American workers are going on strike anymore. So we, we've started a project that's modeled on on that process of data collection that they have uh, in China. So obviously our book didn't create that, <laughs> but you know, it's just just as a way of, of sort of saying that I think that some of the lessons are, are more widely applicable. Right. I mean, what Eli mentioned just uh, really reminded me how this project started when our friend Alan Friedman invited some of the workers who started these projects to the U.S., I think in early 2010s or something like 2012 or 2013, to participate in the Labor Notes Conference in that labor exchange section with American and Canadian workers. I was, I mean, I, I can remember even today very clearly when the two groups of workers exchanged their stories on strike and on other grievance. Um, some workers from the US and uh, Canada side would say, 
not only like I think for these workers, they they were already clear that Chinese workers are not docile. They would strike, but I think what I really remember is they would comment, oh, "Hey, what they did was really something we used to do, and we used to do a lot, but we didn't. We are not doing now, right?" So that was really the story that we are seeing the decline in the U.S. strike cases, and then they realized. Oh, maybe reading the Chinese stories, or oh, we know that you know these strands of white cat strikes, and we could probably do something similar even without you know, without union. All these different things, and on the Chinese workers' side, they were also very benefited from the stories told by American and Canadian workers talking about how they actually did in terms of dealing with collective bargaining, dealing with their grievance, and dealing with some kind of organization. Uh, so I, I was, that was really, I think, the starting point to consider to translate the Chinese benefits of these stories into the English version. And later, when the book was published, Ellen also helped to organize the book tours by the editor of the book to a few cities, talking to workers, talking to unions, and talking to some uh, left journal readership uh, regarding this book. And people talked about the different uh, experience and the mechanisms behind these kind of trajectories and tried to connect some or try to build some kind of solidarity. I think that was really helpful in terms of, you know, disseminate the book's idea, also help to construct some kind of solidarity among readers and among the producers of the stories. We've managed to have in an entire conversation at the end of December 2020, and we barely mentioned COVID-19, which is amazing in itself. Uh, it is obviously the elephant in the room here, and <laughs> this is—I mean, this is an impossible uh, ask in in itself. And so I'm aware of that. But what, as far as you can tell, what are some of the implications or the consequences of COVID-19 that we can already say, or are maybe that have already happened or that are likely to happen? on these labor relations that we've been discussing so far in, in, in the Chinese context? Is it just a matter of, you know, things were bad before and things are now worse in a faster way? And I guess I would couple this with, uh, since I'm guessing it's relevant, you know, the trade war that you've both mentioned, I'm sure it has also had another impactful, uh, an impactful effect. So yeah, how would you interpret the, these past developments? And again, as I said, I know this is probably impossible to answer. So good luck with that. So... The first observation I would like to say is during China's fight against COVID, we see um, migrant worker, migrant workers play a crucial role in um, kind of achieving the relatively successful story of fighting COVID. Um, the stories of, I mean, people usually were amazed by the China speed in building temporary hospitals in the city of Wuhan were largely constructed by migrant workers. Um, they worked for the state-owned companies, but they were also temporary workers. They did not, they do not really have the same benefits enjoyed by their urban formal workers. And also with the rising need of sanitation and food delivery, all these kind of things related to restricted mobility, we are again seeing the uh, force of migrant workers doing significant part of the job in trying to maintain the reproduction of uh, livelihood. So I would say during this entire period of COVID, we're actually seeing the crucial role played by migrant workers, by these temporary workers, although their contribution was not recognized or was their benefits was not really improved. I think this was partly uh, related to uh, what Eli mentioned, the platform labor, related to the development of the platform in terms of food delivery, in terms of ride hailing. I myself work in the ride hailing sector's research. So I basically focus on uh, drivers working for ride hail platforms. And uh, in the past three years, I did three rounds of field work surveys and uh, interviews talking to the workers. Um, and even after the COVID, I mean, two months earlier, I did some interviews with them online as well, just to see 
their work and their life being changed by COVID and what the working conditions were at that time. Um, so the idea I think here is we are seeing the slow transition from manufacturing to these uh, low-end service jobs, although their contribution has been huge, but the benefits, especially the welfare of the work working conditions has been quite limited. And the job is definitely not stable. The income is not stable. And compared to the manufacturing sector, the average working hours in these platform labor has been much longer. And therefore, I would really consider that was part of the impact of COVID, but also COVID probably just accelerate the deteriorating of this sector. And the tendency has been there uh, already well before the COVID. And this, I mean, also I would just add that uh, my research on financialization of the platform economy has shown that during COVID, the influx of uh, venture capital from abroad to China's platform has increased a lot. And that kind of expansion in venture capital really speed up financialization of the platform, making the fan um, platform being able to expand and to absorb more labor from other sectors. And that increase increasing size of platform labor really increased the competitive level of this labor force, which made their working conditions even worse. And just to echo a couple of those things about workers. So, um, you know, as in other countries, uh, we saw during COVID uh, a, a major increase in the significance of, of logistics, basically. So mm -hmm. if you look at the food delivery, the platform-based food delivery, uh, Olema, which is owned by Alibaba and Meituan, which are the two biggest, um, you know, they were adding hundreds of thousands of workers uh, over over a period of just a couple of months. And so they grew really significantly, right, as people were, had to stay at home. Um, and these were the sort of the essential workers. Um, and similar things with other, um, you know, delivery workers. And, and just recently, um, was it uh, last month or the month before, there was a big strike among not food delivery workers, but among the sort of the, the couriers delivering packages. And this was actually a kind of a trans-regional strike. It wasn't sort of centrally organized, but um, you saw it sort of trending in lots of different places around China. You know, it's an old story, but it's, it's basically speed up and it's sort of mediated by, by platforms where, where workers are given sort of a piece rate for delivering a single package and the, the piece rate has continued uh, to fall at precisely the time that they become more important, you know, sort of given uh, given the pandemic. So this shift, and this is just to echo what, what Zhongjin has, has just said, you know, China has been trying to affect a shift to the service economy for a long time. I think that that's been somewhat accelerated by COVID and the kinds of jobs that they're creating in the service sector uh, so far are are not good jobs. Um, so, so that's one thing. The other thing, and, and this is it's difficult to kind of characterize, but it's hard to untangle the effects of COVID from all of the other crazy things that are happening in the world. Um, most importantly, the trade war with uh, the United States and then other kind of geopolitical considerations that emanate from this imperial rivalry. So, you know, because of uh, the trade war, we've already seen a sort of a shift out of manufacturing. As I mentioned, a lot of manufacturing leaving China, um, that has been accelerated. But we've also seen, you know, obvious increased hostility coming from the United States uh, towards China. But, you know, it's not directly because of COVID, but in part due to COVID, what we've also seen uh, an increasing number of other countries turn against China, right? And so there's this Pew poll that comes out sort of you know, assessing people's views of different countries. And sort of the assessment of China in Europe um, and lots of other countries just nosedived um, following COVID. You also have the border sort of conflicts with India. Uh, you have the South China Sea stuff, and you have like you know Chinese uh, people on the internet making fun of BTS because they said something about the Korean War. So there's like you know there, there's these these complicated geopolitics. But I would say that China, the Chinese state by and large, is getting itself into kind of more conflicts with more countries around the world. Australia is is a complete mess. <laughs> the, the the Chinese uh, Australian uh, relationship. Why is all that significant? That's all significant because what that does is it re-emphasizes the Chinese state's desire to shift to a more domestically centered economy. And so Xi Jinping has recently unveiled this idea of the sort of dual circulations economy. And 
Jung Jing could, could certainly talk about it more confidently than I could, but the basic idea is you have two circulations. You have the sort of the global circulation of trade and they say, well, we, we want to keep that going. They just signed this big regional, you know, free trade agreement, the RCEP. But really what it means is they want to reemphasize the domestic circulation, which is to say increasing domestic consumption, sort of re recentering uh, supply chains and particularly critical supply chains within China. And so that they're less um, vulnerable to foreign shocks, as the, in part as they see this more hostile world, of course, led by the United States. But again, we're seeing more hostility from the EU, from Australia, from India, et cetera. So that is really significant. And this is not new. I mean, you can go back to 2003, 2004 and see Wang Jiabao, who was the premier at the time, saying we need to increase domestic consumption. Part of the reason they can't do that is because they have this wage repression and all of the jobs that they're creating are low paid, so they don't actually have the consumers domestically. But so, you know, again, just to sort of say that it's very difficult to disentangle like which pieces of that are caused by COVID and sort of racist uh, targeting of, you know, China as being, you know, the reason that, you know, Western countries are suffering, that, you know, that's maybe part of it. But then there's also this broader sort of economic structural situation, all of which I think is militating towards sort of China becoming more inwardly focused. Well, first, I really appreciate the time you've, the two of you have given me. This has really been really informative. I'm hoping, and I think it's going to be the same for our listeners as well. You've mentioned uh, the recent shifts towards financialization. And uh, Shangjing, you, you said that you have also been shifting your uh, research focus towards that. So can we use that as a, you know, your own, your own closing note to, and at the same time mention the projects that you are working on and where people are listening to, to this can find you online or find your work online as well, if that's okay. Um, the work has not been published yet. <laughs> it's still under review, but I do want to close the kind of my point by emphasizing uh, Eli's point regarding dual circulation strategy. It's very clear that the Chinese economy is still heavily reliant on the overseas market, especially tech knowledge. I think the emphasis of the strategy should really make people aware that how dependent China's economy is on the overseas market and uh, um, tech knowledge abroad rather than being really able to uh, develop its own tech knowledge. And uh, the reason regarding the domestic market, especially during COVID or being hit by COVID, I think it is increasingly clear that the Chinese, there's a large section of the Chinese population is still very poor. It's not because people don't spend, don't consume, they save. It's simply because they don't have enough income to spend. To consume. So really, um, I think it, it calls for more significant, more radical income distribution as well as the restructure of the economy. But we are not really seeing that in the Chinese uh, state as well as in any centralized policy making circle. So, um, a circle. so I, I kind of really, um, I'm still looking for, I should say, I'm still looking for uh, forward to more radical policies, as well as more bottom-up press or pressure uh, for more progressive forces or more progressive changes in the Chinese economy, as well as regarding its influence um, overseas. I, I guess if I want to want to sort of leave listeners with one thing, um, you know, this the China on Strike book and a lot of the research that that I and Joan Jean and others have done on on worker protest. Uh, one of the things that that really sort of motivates me to do it, and, and I think is particularly important now, is is really to identify uh, the commonality of struggles of poor people across different countries, right? Mm -hmm. And, and it, it goes without saying, you know, again, I'm an American. We hear so much about conflict between the United States and China, and so many efforts on the part of both the American state and the Chinese state to sort of drive a wedge between these two countries and force other countries around the world to sort of pick sides. Um, you know, when we approach this, this question of geopolitics from the perspective of workers, it's not to say that workers are themselves not nationalists sometimes. They certainly are in both of these countries, um, but they have common interests. And, and, you know, this is an old story, but oftentimes their, their enemies are precisely the same corporations. I mean, we don't get Apple in its current form without Chinese workers. You know, China is the largest market for General Motors. Um, and, you know, Walmart doesn't exist in its current form without the exploitation of Chinese workers. And, you know, the United States is now TikTok's biggest market, right? So, so, so the capitalists in both these countries, 
they're able to sort of build these vast, you know, global supply chains, incorporating sort of junior partners in say Taiwan or Hong Kong or South Korea, they're able to cooperate, right, to, to exploit uh, workers around the world. Um, and and I, I just think that poor people and, that work, and workers across, uh, across these different countries have, have a lot more in common with each other uh, than they do with, with the elites uh, that run their countries. And, and so I think that this book does a really nice job uh, revealing that. And, and even when we turn, you know, this, this, the, the sort of the stuff in this book at, at this point is already a bit old, right? It's, it's sort of getting up uh, close to 10 years old and China has changed a lot. The United States and, and, and Europe have changed a lot uh, since then. Um, but even if we're looking at the sort of the more recent stuff, we've just been talking about developments in the platform economy and strikes that are happening among delivery workers or food delivery workers. I mean, the same stuff is happening in the United States. Like, you know, here it's, it's maybe uh, Uber or Grubhub or whatever, but the same sort of pushing risk downwards onto workers, uh, al algorithmic forms of control, as well as the kinds of resistance. I mean, it's, there's much more resistance in China than there is in the United States for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but the kind of resistance we're seeing among workers in the U.S. is is increasingly, like I said, kind of looks Chinese-like in nature. It's it's very fractured. It's very small scale. It's without the support of you know collective bargaining agreements or any legal protection. And so we we really do see these commonalities um, on on sort of both sides of this imperial conflict. But on that note, thank you both for your time. This has really been great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.